silver in China. In this way, he could maintain himself as a gentleman. The commandant reported directly to the governor general of New France, sending frequent correspondence about the needs of the fort and developments in the surrounding region. The room where you are standing is the commandant's bedroom. The adjacent room to the east is the officer's dining room, and the small room to the west was used for storage and as an office for the commandant. As you tour the French castle, look for differences between the officers and enlisted men's quarters and possessions. Okay, I'm walking up to the very third floor. So according to the video, this was to like a facade of a roof of a house, but what they really did was put um, gun emplacements. These are the inside, those little shutter doors I was telling you about. So like a roof, like a living area with uh, shutters on the outside. Well, this is the inside of it now. Um, and they were able to roll cannon right up to it to defend the fort. And they're probably used today for a dance hall. I mean, it's just, it's just huge. Let me get back. This is the whole roof of what they call the French castle now. I kind of like the fact that it's all empty. You can move around. I think they might have their little description board there with maybe one, one cannon. I'm going to work my way across the uh, courtyard to go to the, to go to the, um, Up and down, okay. Well, that's about it. Um, it's getting cold, I'm getting hungry. Uh, I'm gonna walk over for this rifle demonstration and then uh, probably just head out. So I was in the top of that one in one of the earlier videos, which is the same as that. They call them like a castle within a castle. Hold on. I bought a book, and if I get some more detailed, I guess if I can blend these videos. I kept cutting out, I think, because of the wind or something. Uh, I kept stopping the video, but I'm gonna work my way over to where that guy's gonna fire in about four minutes, and then uh, videotape that, get in the car, go get something to eat, and head back down. All right, well, I guess the uh, flint lock demonstration's not gonna happen. So I'm walking over to these flags, once again, um, I'm gonna wrap up this video and get moving on. But uh, once again, they said that these flags were representation of the three countries that occupied it. So you got the you got the uh, 15 star and 15 stripe flag in the middle for the United States. Once again, the flag of the design of the War of 1812. You got the British flag. Oh, hold on, I think he's out here. Oh, he's gonna fire the musket. All right, so this is a demonstration. Um, I'm not familiar with that, that type of weapon. I'm gonna say it's a flintlock, or is it something different? It's a flintlock. Uh, you can see clearly here that there's the flint, and that's a steel frizzen, and so the collision is going to lead to, obviously, boom, uh, because it's going to ignite the powder. I'm gonna put it in the pan. It's gonna go inside. It's gonna ignite even more powder, and that's gonna send the round lead ball into some Englishman. Okay, so you're gonna so I'll hear the sound effects. Now would this be fully functioning if in fact you put a round ball down there? Would it fire? Absolutely. We've actually fired these before at a range uh -huh. and because uh, we wanted to do like a test and uh, we tested how how accurate 200, even 50, 75 yards and we hit stuff accurately at about 100 yards uh, but we also hit stuff at 200 yards surprisingly and I'm not going to say it's what we were aiming at, but we hit stuff at 200 yards. So okay. the musket is a lot more uh, accurate, uh, and it goes longer than most people would think. Okay, so I understand why they call it a flint. I see the flint. What's the lock? What, where does that come This in? whole piece right here on the side, that would be the lock. Okay. So it's the whole mechanism. On the bar This is just a barrel, but what what's really the most intricate part of this is this whole piece and you can see that when you unscrew it and I'm not going to do it now 
uh, but you you take a screwdriver, you unscrew it, this whole piece just comes out. Okay. Now, what would be fair to also say is that this piece here, this is going to be replaceable, so they would have to have some of that on them. Oh, yeah. I even have an extra. Give me one second. Oops. There we go. Always keep a spare. Okay. All right, well, you got other guests here, so I'm going to let you get on your demonstration. Okay. No. <laughs> so, um, actually, if you guys want to get out of the wind, and, well, it's not that cold right now, but either way, if you guys want to get out of the wind, we're going to head in, inside here, and we're going to... I'm going to load in there, but obviously I'm not going to fire in there. I get that question a lot when I say that, so just, just so you know. Yeah, oh, thanks. <laughs> okay, so uh, just to clarify for you, uh, with the lock thing, it changes uh, in the 19th century because what they do is they basically replace this whole lock mechanism and they have what they call a hand, it's called the hammer and it looks like a, like a cap gun. Um, you know those little cap guns you have and it's gonna slam on a piece, a, a piece called uh, a cap and that has chemicals in it. I think it's magnesium and something else but my 19th century stuff is not, not too good. I prefer to stay in the 18th century, but it's going to slam. It's going to be an internal firing mechanism because that's going to prevent weather uh, damage or weather conditions from messing you up. So it goes through and it works the same exact way because that explosion is going to go through the barrel either way, just more reliable. Uh, this one is not as reliable, uh, more reliable than what they would call a match lock, which is basically how do I describe this? It's going to be a piece of burning rope that you pull the trigger and it just lowers that piece of burning rope on top of the gunpowder. So not reliable at all. This is a little bit more reliable, but that, that cap lock is going to be much more reliable. So either way, just be um, before I get to the fun part, this uniform that I'm wearing today is the uniform of a Marine in the French forces, the Compagnie Franche de la Marine. And they're the ones that built the first building in the fort, that one over there. And by the way, all the stone's original. So um, what you're walking on, technically, this is 1760s. But if you go over to the big building, that's 1726. So the Marines are responsible for kind of settling this area. And what they're wearing, this ridiculous looking hat, it's called a cocked hat, not a pirate hat. So. Uh, it's, co it's called a cocked hat because it's cocked up on three sides and really what it does is gives you a very interesting tan line in the summer, but it makes you look good. So it's a fashion item, it's not really supposed to be practical. Uh, I have a juste core on, that's just a heavy wool coat, about 14 pounds of wool, which is kind of sad because this gun is 14 pounds. Uh, going on, I'm wearing a vesti, another coat, that's another 6 pounds of wool. So. In the summer, it really seals in the flavor. So luckily for you, we bathe daily, so you're welcome. Uh, on top of that, I have one more layer. I've got a shirt, it's a long sleeve shirt that goes from my neck down to about my knees. And the reason why the shirt's so long is because we don't have boxers, we don't have tidy whities we don't have briefs. So we have to cover up the giggly bits somehow. And that's why we wear the long shirts. Your shirt is your underwear. Now, again, luckily for you guys, I'm not being that accurate today. So you're welcome. <laughs> Going on, I'm wearing wool knee breeches. I've got canvas gaiters that protect your legs from anything you're going to be walking through. Thorns, brush, that kind of stuff. And last but not least, I'm wearing leather buckled shoes and musket. And the difference between a musket and a rifle is the fact that the musket's pretty much the same, except for the fact that the rifle would have rifling, hence the name. Uh, going down the barrel, it'd be spiral grooves that would spin that rifle ball and it would make it more accurate, kind of like a, a football. So you could hit stuff at about 300 yards. Uh, the musket here, you could hit a man-sized target accurately as a professional soldier at about 100 yards. So why do we use muskets instead of rifles? Rifles are expensive, three times more expensive. And this is one of the very few times in history where you see governments that actively try to save money. Thank you for laughing. <laughs> uh, but on top of that, it takes 15 seconds to load a musket. It takes a whole minute to reload a rifle. 
because the rifle needs a very tight fitting ball to scrape along the grooves. Uh, this one, we're going to be using a slightly loose fitting ball, and I'll get into that in a second. So, how it's going to work, when I pull the trigger, hopefully this piece called le chien, or the dog, because I thought it looked like the head of a dog, is going to be thrown forward. Hopefully this piece of foot is going to hit this piece of steel, hopefully causing sparks. And hopefully that, those sparks will hopefully land on top of some black powder that's hopefully going to be in that pan there shortly. And hopefully that's going to be like a fuse that's going to ignite, hopefully going through a small hole, and hopefully it's going to ignite even more black powder at the bottom of the barrel here. And hopefully the pressure created by that is going to send that round lead musket ball into some English pig dog. Now I said a lot of hopefullys because the gun doesn't like to go off in the sleet, the snow, the hail, rain, too hot, too cold, too windy, too foggy, too muggy, and Sundays aren't real good either. See you later. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. And I'm going to open it. Well, this is why they wanted you to have four good teeth in your mouth and join the military in the 18th century. Now these were designed for a smaller gun, so I have to use two, so pretend that didn't happen. What you would do first is prime the pan, and then, oh, I forgot to explain. It's just a paper tube. It's filled with black powder. There'd be a musket ball right here at the bottom of the cartridge in the 18th century. Uh, the problem is today we have insurance companies that really hate it when we kill people. So no musket ball, but it will still go boom. I'm going to take my ram rod out. I'm going to ram the cartridge to the bottom of the barrel. You might be wondering, why am I ramming the paper down with the rest of the powder? That's what's going to hold the ball in the barrel, because if I don't have that paper and I point the gun down, what do I look like? I'm hoping for a unanimous idiot. <laughs> now, if I don't return the ramrod to where it's been, I'm going to turn that Englishman into a shish kebab. That sounds good for me as a Frenchman, except for the fact that I can't reload without this and I doubt he's going to return it saying, here you go, old chap, I think you lost something. Therefore, I have just turned my very nice musket into a very expensive stick. So, for this part, obviously, we're going to go outside. I'm sure you guys want to hear. For what? On the count of three, two, one. Nope. See what I mean? So. When I said hopefully the, pan, the powder will be in the pan, sometimes it falls out. I won't lie. All right. So here we go. Try number two. The count of three, two, one. Oh my God. What? That sounds like a cannon. Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you do no, that all day? Cannon is much louder, trust me. Uh, we shoot cannons in the summer, um, for the most part, you know, May, June.